Good evening. Welcome to the Salem Area Mass Transit District's Board of Directors meeting. Today is Thursday, September 28th, 2023. We're in the Senator hearing room. Um, I will go ahead and call this meeting to order. I will note that we do have a quorum present of um, board members, and I'll also note for the record that President Enohos Pressi is excused for this meeting and that she has asked me, Vice President Davidson, to chair the meeting. Uh, next, I'll invite General Manager Pollock to provide us with a safety moment. Great, thank you. So earlier today, uh, we held a, a monthly General Manager's Roundtable, and I'm going to borrow the safety message that was presented by Melissa Kidd today because it was very appropriate. And, and the elements of that were that uh, uh, October begins in a couple of days, which uh, creates the real change of weather in the fall, and we've experienced it this week with the rain. Uh, I just remember the rain, especially roads, causes that first layer of oil to be slippery. Uh, so be cautious. Uh, recognize that as the leaves fall, they become slip hazards because they're wet and slippery and can hide uh, trip hazards uh, as they pile up. So be aware of that, especially as kids are out now uh, in going to school, it's getting darker. All of those individually may not be much, but if you add them all together, it creates safety hazards. So uh, as I had said last month, be vigilant. Uh, uh, you can be right and wrong at the same time. So always be aware of what other people are doing so you can properly respond uh, as needed. And that concludes my safety message. Thank you, General Manager Pollock. Uh, next, we'll proceed to the oath of office, so I will invite the clerk of the board and uh, Director Carney to step forward and uh, do the oath of office. I, Sadie Carney, affirm that I will support the Constitution and laws of the United States and the state of Oregon, and that I will faithfully perform my duties as treasurer for the board of directors of the Salem Area Mass Transit District for the for the term ending June 30th, 2025, or until my successor is duly appointed and qualified. Thank you. Uh, next, it is my pleasure and privilege to invite up the president of the board of directors for the Imperial Sovereign Court of the Willamette Empire, Michael Shelley, as well as uh, Prince Royale to the 45th reign of the Imperial Sovereign Court of the Willamette Empire, Beth Delaney, for a presentation. Representative of the LGBTQIA community, the ISCWE would like to thank the Salem Area Mass Transit District board and members for the Ride with Pride bus that serviced Salem and the surrounding areas during June of this year. Seeing the Ride with Pride bus was a great symbol of your allyship and, quite frankly, your courage. For the LGBTQIA QIA plus community. It was a wonderful sight to see and created so many good and safe feelings. It gave us hope for better days to come and more understanding of the future. The members of the LGBTQIA community wanted to express their gratitude by signing these boards that we presented to you today. Um, again, thank you so very much. It really gave a lot of people hope, um, especially in the times that we're going through as gay, lesbian, trans community. Um, so being that you guys were able to do this was a huge impact for us. And we really
really do appreciate that. I just like to uh, give a personal thanks to all of you. I know that sometimes it takes great courage to do the right thing, and you did. Um, we know that you took a little bit of backlash for it, and we certainly understand that. Um, and thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you did. And we would like to extend a, a hand to you of cooperation, and if there's anything that we can do as, a, as an organization to assist you in any way, uh, we would be most grateful for the invitation. So um, thank you so much. Thank you to, the, to you both. Um, here I'll ask uh, the board members to see if there's any questions, but before I open it up to questions, I'm, I'm hoping that you too might be able to just briefly explain for uh, those of you, who, those of us that may not know uh, what the court does. <laughs> the ISCWE is a 501c3 charity organization that raises money for various charities. Uh, we represent six counties in Oregon, that Marion, Polk, Lynn, Benton, Yamhill and Lincoln. Very good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and um, we raise money for organizations like HIV Alliance. Um, this year we we're raising for NAMI. NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. Um, we've also support, give, given our support to, uh, uh, there was a, I can't remember the name of the church right now, but they um, uh, sheltered battered women. Um, so, and we are in our 45th reign. Um, unfortunately, our reigning empress, Moulin Rouge, was not able to make it today. Otherwise, she would have uh, been very eager to express her uh, guide for the rest of her reign. Um, and uh, we do this, we raise the funds by fundraisers like drag shows. Um, and various events. Um, I myself am a drag queen. <laughs> um, I've been doing it for a little over 13 years now and have loved every minute of it. There's been some challenges. There's been some, you know, uh, interesting things that have happened over the course of our time. Beth has been involved for... 42 years. Yeah. <laughs> so she's been around for a while. So, but we have personally, as a drag queen, I enjoy being a whole other character. Um, when my father found out that I wanted to do drag, his first question was, do you want to be a woman? And I said, no, Dad, you got to think about it. From ninth grade on, I was involved in theater and music and dance. So being a drag queen, my, I go by the name of Crystal Decanter, it's a whole new character for me. It's somebody that I can express a whole different attitude. And um, I have so much fun doing it, being able to get up on the stage and you know, expressing an art form. Um, and I just have a ball with it. And as, as on behalf of a lot of our other drag queens that have been doing it for either a year or two or as long as 40 to 45 years, they all feel the same way. It's, it's a great way to express ourselves in a whole different aspect. So that's, in a nutshell, that's basically what we are. And, and so if you have any questions, by all means. Thank you for that explanation. Any questions? Please. Is this on? Uh, no, it is. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I just want to thank you both for for coming here for tonight, uh, for coming here tonight, and for the the care that you are taking in our communities when you are describing some of the efforts you're making in a variety of spaces around, you know, mental health and and different kinds of you know, challenging domestic situations. Um, that's so important. So I just appreciate the, the love that you bring to our community, the care that you bring to our community and um, all you do. So thank you. <coughs> thank, you. thank you. And like Beth said earlier, um, if there is anything that <coughs> our organization can do to help bolster 
chariots because I do know that there are several of our members that ride chariots. And um, when they found out that we were going to do this, they were very excited because they were like, yes, finally, you know, we can get something back. So by all means, if there's anything, uh, you can contact myself, Beth, uh, any member of the ICW, we'd be more than help, happy to help in any way we can to, like you said, contribute to your allyship because that did mean a lot to us all. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for presenting us with these boards and thank you for all that you do in the community. Same to thank you, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next we'll turn to public comment and we do not have any members of the public who have signed up uh, in person. I'll take a moment to see if there's anyone tuning in online who would like to provide co public comment and hearing none, uh, we'll go ahead and proceed to the consent calendar. So uh, if there are no issues with the items on the consent calendar, would someone like to make a motion? I move to approve the consent calendar. We have a motion. A second. And a second. Any discussion on the motion? No, see no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, seeing none, uh, motion passes unanimously. Next, we'll go ahead and proceed to our first action item, which is an approval of our Title VI plan. Thank you, I'd ask Ted Stonecliffe, our transit planner, to please present the report. Good evening, Vice President Davidson and members of the board. Tonight, we're here to present an update to our Title VI program, uh, which we are obligated to submit to Federal Transit Administration every three years. Uh, we will be submitting it uh, on the October 1st deadline with your approval tonight. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act protects people from discrimination based on race, color, and national origin. And with this program, uh, with this update, I should say, uh, there are three major, major parts of the program that I want to focus on uh, that are updated. First is updating the demographic data from our old 2010 decennial census data to 2020. And from the American Community Survey, uh, the five-year averages updating from 2014 to 2018 average to 2017 to 2021 five-year average. Uh, all of the maps that are in the program have been updated to reflect those demographic changes. Uh, we also are including copies of our major service change equity analyses and fare equity an analyses that have occurred since June of 2020. And we're reporting on service monitoring and how the district's bus service is performing in relation to minority routes versus what we call non-minority routes. The definition of that is included in the program. Other attachments representing how SAMTD has involved Title VI po populations in public outreach and the policies and procedures governing planning functions governed by the Title VI rules and regulations set forth by the FTA are included as a large packet at the very end. So at this time, I'd like to recommend that the board adopt resolution 2023-09 to approve the 2023 Title VI program and direct the general manager to submit the plan document to the Federal Transit Administration by October 1st, 2023, as required by federal rules and regulations. And I'd be happy to address any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Planner Stonecliffe. Any questions from the board? Thank you for your work on this. It's a substantial document, and so uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Our pleasure. I'll go ahead and lead with a question. Uh, 
kind of acknowledging what Director Holmstrom said and recognizing that there is a deadline here. Uh, if you had more time, what would you have liked to have tackled, included, or changed? Thank you for that question, Director Davidson. Yes, I, I believe the complaint procedure is one that we are working on at this time. Uh, we're developing a standard operating procedure so that all of our frontline staff, our customer service representatives, our security, our, our um, bus operators know what the procedure is uh, if a Title VI complaint is made. And uh, so that's one thing that this is a living document, and so we will be making revisions as we go. But uh, for the short answer to your question, that, that would be one of them. That's, that's a wonderful answer. Thank you for providing sure. that. It, to follow up to that uh, response, recognizing that it is a living document, however, these are due to the FTA every three years. Can we, for example, 11 months from now, when we have a better complaint procedure, update the document, or is that not necessary because we have internal controls for that, and then it will just be formally updated in this document? Because with the exception of these seven individuals on the board here, or at the dais here, and yourself and maybe a few cherished others, nobody's reading this other than the FTA. Uh, yes, to answer your question, we can make updates as often as the board would would like. Uh, we're required to do it every three years okay. uh, to meet our obligations with FTA. But uh, certainly if there's something, an update that we want to make official and post on the website, we're welcome to do that at any point. Great, that's helpful, thank you. Director Kearney. Uh, thank you, Director Davidson. <clears throat> I'm curious about um, the census data. I think it arrived late, and I think there were concerns when it was being collected about possible undercounts of some populations, and I can imagine why some groups of people or individuals would be hesitant to answer a knock at the door when a government official is on the other side. Um, so I was just wondering, as you were looking at the data and the shifts in data, um, was there anything that gave you concern or made you think, hmm, well, maybe in, maybe in 2030 it'll level out or you know what I mean there there won't be the kind of trends that I'm seeing here I'm just interested thank you for that question director Carney uh, I don't think there's anything that would direct my concern at the data it, it's true that the data took a while mostly because of the pandemic to be released and even today the US Census Bureau is is releasing more and more I think last week there was a release for example of more demographic detail. Uh, you can drill down to uh, 1,500 different ethnic groups now in, in this data. <laughs> so uh, it's quite, uh, qu quite detailed. Uh, the maps um, in the document are sometimes hard to read because they are at a smaller scale, but we are able to drill into those uh, census blocks with our computers much, in much more detail, uh, and, and quite frankly, the minority data is much more detailed than it has ever been. Uh, we're really seeing uh, down to almost the city block of where we have concentrations of, and, and that'll help us as planners to really pinpoint uh, where there may be disparate impacts, for instance. So. Uh, it's a great update, I think. I'm really excited that we were able to get the census update. And um, sure, there are always questions about uh, whether uh, certain people may participate in the census or not, but uh, we work with the data that we can. And uh, as more detailed data comes through, we'll be sure to work with that data. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, 
one more curiosity. Given the, the granular level of data that we have, are we able to import that into, say, Remix or other planning tools that you use in your day-to-day? Thank you for that question, Director Davidson. Yes, uh, we use a program called TBEST. It stands for Transit Boardings Estimation Simulation Tool. And in uh, that has a GIS base in the background, and so we're able to import all of the census data. Uh, Remix also is a platform that pulls in uh, the most recent American Community Survey data. Uh, so those are just two two of the tools that we have, um, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited because we're able to look at things like we haven't been able to um, for, for many years. So uh, it, it's a wonderful update, and if I may say so myself, but <laughs> uh, that's for you to judge. But uh, I'm excited about the data and uh, the level of detail. That's very exciting, and for the record, I do think it is wonderful as well, so you've at least got two people on your side. <laughs> um, if there's no other questions, would someone, oh please, Director Navarro. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. So one of the things that I thought about um, as I'm kind of reviewing this is, because um, you'd mentioned that there's a couple of different things that you had thought about, including in this, was um, disparate impacts of technology, maybe one of those things. Mm. Thank you for that question, Director Navarro. Uh, Yes, uh, there are studies that are coming out that, uh, and and the FTA is developing a new uh, Title VI circular. Uh, we haven't got the new one yet, uh, but that is in, in development uh, right now. And so there may be some new things that are coming out, such as access to technology. Uh, another metric that I've seen is uh, women heads of household who have children who may be more dependent on transit. Um, so things like that, uh, the current program uh, doesn't address as directly. So uh, as those revisions come through, we will be adopting those. But uh, for now, uh, the two prim primary things that we look at are income levels and uh, race. So, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Director Duncan. Sorry, we do this to each other. One person asks a question, it leads to another question. Um, given that information, uh, just purely your personal opinion, knowing that you're one of the few people that have gone through this data in, in, in explicit detail, um, and knowing kind of the holes in the system, is there anything that you think that we could concentrate on more into the next three years? <laughs> Thank you for that question, Director Duncan. Um, uh, well, the... The complaint procedure is one that we're working on as we speak. Um, uh, also with our, our ITS program, our intelligent transportation program, we'll be getting an increased level of data for the service we have on the street. And so things like on-time performance, uh, the amenities we have at our stops. And uh, right now we have a, a level of detail that is uh, gonna increase significantly once we have a reliable uh, computer-aided dispatch automated vehicle location system, mm -hmm. CAT AVL. Uh, so those, those are exciting things on the horizon that uh, are, are to look forward to and, and will affect these analyses. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Final call. Okay. Seeing no further questions, would someone like to make the motion? I move that the board adopt resolution number 2023-0029 to approve the 2023 Title VI program and, the, and direct the general manager to submit the plan document to Federal Transit Administration by October 1st, 2023. That's so hard to say. I second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, our final action item for the evening is to, is with regards to the general manager performance evaluation, 
Um, yeah, would you? Sure. Uh, so the item before you tonight is uh, uh, whether or not you shall complete the general manager's performance evaluation process and compensation change process. So in accordance with board policy, uh, the board is <coughs> excuse me, responsible for e evaluating the performance of the general manager. In addition to the evaluation, the board shall give consideration to any changes in the general manager's compensation package. In June of this year, uh, the general manager completed their self-evaluation, which was distributed to the board, and the board then completed their individual performance evaluations. Our chief human resources officer uh, uh, prepared a composite performance evaluation for the board's review, and you did that at an executive session during the July board meeting. Subsequent to that, you continued your executive session on September 14th to continue the review of the performance evaluation and to potentially formulate a compensation adjustment. Uh, there is no staff recommendation, but uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, General Manager Pollock. Um, I'd like to open it up for a motion. I move that the board approve a 5% base salary merit pay award and a 2% base salary merit increase effective July 1st of 2023. We have a motion. I'll second. And a second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Please. Um, I just want to thank my fellow board members for the really insightful conversation and discussion in this regard. I am consistently impressed with how thoughtful um, this group is, and I also would like to thank General Manager Pollock for all of the work he does on the community's behalf. Um, this is well deserved. I'd also like to speak up and uh, really highlight the thought and consideration that this board put into this decision, uh, both the evaluation and then the, the merit-based increases in pay. Um, as General Manager Pollock kind of summarized, this has been a months-long process. Uh, this process, as he noted, uh, began in formally, I suppose, in June when we as individual board members conducted uh, or responded to a survey that was put together with the aid of assistance, uh, excuse me, with the aid of hired consultants who, prep professional, who are professionals in this area. Um, this, of course, does not happen in a vacuum. This reflects um, our interactions with the general manager. This reflects um, the work of the general manager over the past year. Um, and then after the surveys were compiled, the executive committee met, deliberated, discussed, and then this went to the board where, uh, as General Manager Pollock mentioned, we met in July, had that discussion, and then uh, we did not actually take action on that day because we needed more information, so we went and sought additional information. Uh, we then requisitioned salary comparisons with not only local uh, CEOs or uh, equivalent titles, for example, the superintendent of Salem Kaiser Public School, but also regional public transit leaders. Uh, so that's Washington and Oregon. And so we could get a true sense of not only his individual performance here locally in the district, but also to better understand how he rates uh, for salary uh, compared to his peers, uh, both in the industry and then locally. Um, so. As I think you will see in just a moment, uh, we as a board are united uh, in this. And uh, this was deliberate, this was thoughtful, and this reflects the trust that we have as a board in you, General Manager Pollock. So uh, if anybody else would like to speak up, please. If not, um, I'll call the vote. Since we do have a motion, we do have a second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No one, one's opposed. Okay, motion passes unanimously. General Manager Pollock, if you'd like to say Yes, a few I, words. I would like to say a few words. Uh, first off, uh, board, uh, thank you very much for your support uh, and trust in me uh, leading the organization. But I should say uh, I don't do this in a vacuum. Uh, we've got a great team uh, here at Chariots, and it's a collective effort. Uh, as we move the organization forward. Uh, and we will continue that. Uh, 
it's my honor to be the general manager of Chariots, uh, and I have uh, loved the job since I've gotten here, uh, and I'll continue to do my best uh, while I'm here. So, but, so thank you for your support. Thank you, General Manager Pollock. That concludes our action items for the evening. We, we do, however, have two informational reports, the first of which is the Fiscal Year 2023 Security and Emergency Management Report. I'd ask Karen Garcia to please come forward to present the report. Good evening, Vice President Davidson and members of the board. I am here this evening to present the fiscal year 2023 Security and Emergency Management Report. Next slide. Thank you. Um, as you can see, we have a multi-agency approach to security and emergency management here at Chariots, and we partner with a number of private companies as well as law enforcement to um, provide the security services to our internal and external customers. Next slide. The security team is responsible for providing information on chariot services to our ridership and members of the public. Uh, we respond to safety and security concerns that are brought forward. We analyze security statistics as they're gathered throughout the year. Um, most importantly is providing a strong security presence at the transit centers and throughout the system. Um, develop and revise policy and procedure, enforce ordinances, and overall just our goal is to maintain a safe environment for everyone who interacts with chariots. Next slide. At the transit centers, we partner with private security providers. During this past fiscal year, we actually had two providers at the transit centers. Um, our contract with Allied Universal was through the majority of the year. That contract ended at the end of its term in May of 2023. And after a competitive process, we selected a new private security partner in PPC Solutions. They took over the security services June 1st. So those private security officers are unarmed licensed officers with the state of Oregon. Um, they staff both the downtown transit center and the Kaiser Transit Center. They assist riders and focus a big piece of their um, time on customer service because they're out there on the platform all day long and they're easy access to folks that are using the service. So they do a lot of customer service. Again, one of their main goals is um, to be present, to have that security presence, um, to be there and be available to the ridership. They respond to incidents when called either on board a bus or at the transit centers. They also are responsible for ordinance enforcement and reaching out for a law enforcement response should we have a criminal activity occur. Next slide. We have one more private security partner that we work with and that partner is DPI Group. They provide the security services at the Dell Webb Operations Headquarters. Um, they've been with us for a couple years now. Their officers are also unarmed security professionals licensed with the state of Oregon. They provide security coverage at the Dell Webb Operations Headquarters 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As I'm sure most of you know, that campus is open with the gates open about 22 hours a day. So it is very valuable to have a security presence there um, in front of that operations center to make sure that we don't have unauthorized persons entering the property. So they monitor access and they respond to incidences and they too will call for a police response as needed. Next slide. Um, the final formal agreement that we have is a memorandum of understanding with Salem Police Department. We have a longstanding relationship with the city and Salem Police Department to assist us in our law enforcement needs. Um, this Memorandum of Understanding provides for a liaison officer who is part of the Community Action Unit of Salem Police Department. That liaison officer assists with us and partners with us um, to investigate crime, information sharing, evidence sharing when incidences do occur. Um, they assist us with youth concerns and issues and help us connect riders who are in need with services that are available throughout the community. 
we work with them to enhance livability in the community as well, and they aid us in, in criminal investigations. If we need an officer to respond, we contact the Willamette Valley Communications Center, just like any other business or private citizen. So we call the non-emergent number or 911 to get a police response. But this liaison officer is in addition to our, in the moment we need an officer to respond, it's more of a collaborative relationship when we're dealing with more systemic issues. Next slide. So let's get into the numbers. Um, these slides are separated on the left side. Uh, you'll see information about the downtown transit center on the right side, the Kaiser Transit Center. And then fiscal year 22 is shown in blue and fiscal year 23 is shown in red. So it's a, it shows each of the four quarters of the year, but the blue and red show the year by year comparison. So these, graphs show the activity of our private security contractors. We do way more customer service at Chariots than just the numbers that are shared today. If you look at all the service from our customer service representatives, our partnership with the transit host program, all the customer service that our internal employees, transit operators, et cetera, provide. But these are the numbers that are collected by our private security providers, primarily at the transit centers. Um, so we um, continue to have a lot of interaction with our customers and provide them with support the best that we can so that they can not only interact with chariots, but also with wayfinding in the downtown core. Next slide. This slide shows the exclusions and exclusion warnings. So as I mentioned earlier, our private security providers one of their roles is the enforcement of our district ordinances, which outline the behavior expectations of our ridership. The exclusions are shown on the left of this graph and written warnings are shown on the right. Um, the exclusion numbers did go up significantly over the past year, as is indicated in the report. Um, but if you look at ridership, our ridership is thankfully gone up a lot in the last year. And I think that the activity in the downtown core just overall has changed significantly over the last 12 months. And that is reflected in the numbers of behavior violations and problems that we're seeing on the system. So that um, kind of speaks to how those numbers have gone up and, and the cause behind those. Next slide. So we like to start out with public education so when we have a minor infraction of an ordinance, we generally start with a public education, excuse me, sir, ma'am, you can't smoke here, or please don't ride your bike here, those types of interactions. And these we count as ordinance warnings, so they're verbal instead of a written document or an exclusion being issued, it's an educational uh, piece and a request for compliance. So this includes everything from riding your bike or smoking, um, things like that that are not excludable or that we would choose not to exclude, definitely not on a first offense. Um, next slide. The next slide shows the detail of what the blue and red graph showed. Those were the overall numbers, but this shows the breakdown of different types of ordinance violations. The different colors on this graph just reflect the different quarters. Um, but as you'll see at the top of the graph, private vehicles in the bus lane, um, the numbers of vehicles in the bus lane at the Kaiser Transit Center are significant. Um, I think a lot of the um, GPS systems that people use to navigate on the roadway, um, they turn people into the Kaiser Transit Center and when people realize that they're not on their way to I-5 as they're leaving shopping at Kaiser Station, they um, immediately want to get out of there as quickly as possible. And the first turn available to them is the bus lane. So people will turn into that bus lane to get turned around and be able to exit the transit center. Um, it has been an ongoing problem there. We've put in a lot of signage and things like that, but it, it is continuing to be a challenge. So we're looking towards the future at other things that we might be able to implement to decrease um, the likelihood of an accident by reducing the number of private cars in that bus lane. But other than that, um, we see smoking where people are prohibited from smoking, um, riding skateboards, loitering, bike riding, things of that nature are pretty common from year to year. Next slide. 
This slide shows the number of incident reports that are generated by our private security provider. It does not include incident reports that are submitted by internal staff like transit operators or facilities maintenance workers. These are just security staff numbers. Uh, on the left, Downtown Transit Center. On the right, Kaiser Transit Center. Um, they also do not include any police-involved incidents. I'll report on those later. So these are just incidents that our security team is managing. The next slide shows a breakdown um, of each of the different types of incidences that are, were included in that previous slide. Next slide. So the most common types of incidents are fairly common from year to year. I've been providing this report for probably close to 10 years now, and we see the same three or four items rise to the top every single year. Um, this year, disorderly conduct was at the top as it was last year, but we did see quite a bit of increase. Um, last year, we had 58, and in fiscal year 23, we were up to 83. Medical emergencies are always high. Um, trespass, the trespass numbers greatly increase, and that's why I wanted to add the information on the slide. We are not calling the police for as many trespass cases as we did previously. Um, if we can get people to leave the property peacefully, we choose to take that option instead. And so that's why you see more trespass numbers here under the private security area, and um, not quite as many were referred to police for action. And then finally, graffiti and vandalism, which is just <clears throat> general course for business. We do, we do experience, um, gratefully, not a lot of damage, but we do see quite a bit of graffiti throughout the year. Next slide. So this slide speaks to our requests for police response at the transit centers. This does not include any police response that we request to buses out in the system or to shelters in the community, just to the transit centers. Uh, the numbers went up this year, and a lot of that had to do with activity on the city sidewalk. Even though our numbers are what they are on the property, uh, we don't have jurisdiction on the city sidewalk, but to be a good citizen and partner of the community, if we see illegal behavior, if we see fights, any aggressive behavior, we're calling for a police response because we know that that impacts our service and the people that are here using the service. Next slide. Um, disorderly conduct again rose to the top and this chart uh, outlines the other incidences that we call police for and a breakdown of what each of those were. Next slide. The most common types of incidences that we call police for disorderly conduct. These non-chariots incidents are um, things that are on the sidewalk, things that don't have anything to do with our system or violations on our property, but other things that we're calling for a police response for that don't have anything to do with us per se, or if a crime com is committed in the community or elsewhere, someone is had a warrant issued against them and the police make contact with them on our property, that too is counted in this non-chariots number. And then uh, again, you'll see here trespass and then other incidences are at the bottom. Next slide. This slide for disorderly conduct wraps together the private security disorderly conduct numbers and the law enforcement involved disorderly conduct number. So this is the total number of disorderly uh, behavior incidences that we had. And you will see that we did have quite a bit of an increase from 91 in fiscal year 22 up to 145 in fiscal year 23. Of those 145 disorderly behavior incidents, we had 28 that involved assaultive behavior or physical contact between individuals. Of those 28, 24 of them involved citizens, riders of the system, or, or people uh, crossing across the transit center on our property. Um, thankfully, only three involved our employees, and one involved a contract security officer. So of the 28, four involved our staff and contractors. Next slide. Um, just one slide to report on DPI out at Del Webb. Uh, we don't have a lot of incidences out there, but we did have 10 incident reports during fiscal year 23. That was down quite a bit from the year before. The year before was our first year with security on the site. And so 
that presence has brought down the likelihood of unauthorized persons being on the property. Next slide. So this year, uh, beginning April 1st of 2023, there was a new reporting requirement required of all transit agencies from the National Transit Database related to assaultive and aggressive behavior against transit workers and transit operators. So I wanted to report out on that. So transit operators, that's self-explanatory. The other group of other transit workers includes other employees of the district and our contractors. So uh, physical assault is defined as any physical contact. So that could be being hit, having something thrown at someone, being spat on, anything like that is considered a physical assault in this new reporting requirement. A non-physical assault would include threats or intimidation made against an employee or a transit worker. So for the last quarter um, of the year, in April we had no reportable events. In May we had one physical assault against a transit operator. And in June we had three non-physical assaults. Um, so threats or intimidation against transit operators. Next slide. Looking to fiscal year 24, which I can't believe we're already so far into, um, we've got a lot of security initiatives coming up this year. Uh, we have an extremely active security committee. So um, in February of 2022, we put together a group that was to look at system safety and security. And that group uh, at the end of last calendar year the role of that group was merged into the role of our active safety committee. So because they had two different roles now, um, the committee deliberated and decided that the best approach would be to have two meetings a month. One month, uh, one meeting each month, we dedicate solely to safety topics, as they have always done. But we added a second meeting where that whole committee comes together and they speak specifically to security concerns in the system and what they're seeing out there as an employees so that we can review policy, uh, review incidences and make recommendations to leadership to enact changes, add training for staff, things of that nature. Um, so that's an active group. I'm excited. It takes a little bit of time for a group to gel and kind of get their direction. And after several meetings, I feel like we're there. I'm not a voting member of the committee, but I am an advisor to the committee and play an active role in that. But I'm excited to see what's going to come out of that group in the coming year. I think that they've got some good ideas um, that can really help guide leadership into um, considering some new options to address security. And then we have our agency safety plan that we've had in place for a couple years now. Each year that's reviewed where we take a look at any internal actions we can take to reduce the likelihood and severity of security risks that we're exposed to. Next slide. Uh, we are always striving to enhance our training for staff. So agency-wide, we really want to focus on de-escalation training. Uh, that's a requirement of our agency safety plan. And because if we are seeing an increase in, in, in an escalation of violent acts and aggressive behavior, we really want to give staff the tools that they need while they're out there working each day. Um, Pre-COVID, we facilitated and led a stakeholder group um, in this room where we met quarterly and we had a number of different agencies that were participating in that group to address the problems that we were having, um, you know, out on High Street pre-COVID. We had problems with um, youth getting involved in instances. We had homelessness issues, mental health um, and addiction problems, just like we do today. Um, so we had brought a group together to, to collaborate and problem solve for community livability reasons. And over COVID, we did not meet at all. And we are reviving that group and starting to um, get new contacts at each of those agencies, see what other partners we can bring in and get that, that group meeting again. Um, because everything that happens here impacts everyone in the downtown core and uh, partnering with the different law enforcement agencies, the school districts, transit districts and others, I think that we can come up with some ideas and work together to address some of those issues. 
Uh, and then working with our new private security provider, um, they, like I said, they just started in June, and so they're starting to get more fully staffed. They're starting to understand what the needs of chariots are, and most importantly, be that good presence out on the transit system and are available to our ridership and our staff as needed. Um, we want to look at some alternative approaches to addressing some of the behavior issues. Uh, law enforcement do not have the same resources that they did years ago, and sometimes it's uh, not possible for them to respond in the same way or to take the same enforcement action. So we've got to look outside the box, think of new ideas um, for how to address some of these behaviors and minimize the safety and security risks the best that we can with the resources we have. And then continue with safety and security campaigns to our ridership to help them interact with the system as safely as they can. Next slide. So moving on, uh, reporting out on the emergency planning activities that we did in fiscal year 23. Um, there's not a lot of slides here, but it seems like our emergency coordinator is always buzzing around working with someone in the community to plan something and how can we inject security, or excuse me, inject chariots into that planning process and get us to the table. Um, so this is just a few of the highlights. Each year we participate in the Great Shakeout, which is a nationwide earthquake preparedness drill. We do it every year in October. Uh, we have done it in, at Chariots for a number of years now, and we typically partner with Marion County to do a shakeout drill here at Courthouse Square. Um, we'll continue to do that in future years, but it's a good opportunity not only to do the exercise when the shakeout technically happens, but leading up to that, there's a lot of educational materials that are presented to staff. Uh, we go and meet with transit operators, maintenance staff at their departmental stand-up meetings and share information with them so that they're not only prepared here at work, but that they can prepare personally and help their families be prepared um, the best that they can for incidences like that. Next slide. Uh, we also did quite a bit of work in this past year with facility evacuation preparedness, specifically at the uh, Courthouse Square building. At this building, we have a partnership with Marion County because we both occupy the building. And so in the event of an emergency, we need to work together to communicate clearly to both staff groups to make sure that we're not sending mixed messages. So anytime we have an emergency and we evacuate the building, we have a joint incident command. So we have an incident commander from Chariots and an incident commander from Marion County that partner together and make sure that we've evacuated safely. We interact with law enforcement or fire department personnel who are responding to the emergency. So we'd like to exercise those plans and make sure that our communication systems are in place and that staff are trained to make sure that everyone's out of the building if we have an emergency. So we did quite a bit of that during the past year and we'll continue to do that in the coming year. Um, actually, in 2024, uh, we really hope to do more of that at the Dell Web Operations Headquarters. We have some systems in place, but we haven't exercised it as much as we'd like to. And we've hired a lot of new staff. I know that's a surprise to everyone, but we've hired a lot of new staff in the last few years. So we want to make sure that they not only understand what needs to happen in an emergency here, but at all three of our facilities. Next slide. Uh, another big initiative that we worked on this year was updating our continuity of operations plan. Um, we wrote a plan in 2017-2018 timeframe, but a lot of things have changed since then. So a year ago, last year in August, we kicked off a refresh project and we've been uh, going through our plan phase by phase to make sure that it's current. We've incorporated uh, the new processes, procedures, technology, new staff, um, so that we make sure if anything were to happen, we've got a good continuity of operations plan that we can pull off the shelf and, and use to help us keep our business going and continue to provide that service to the community. So phase one was the, the people side of it, where we looked at our delegations of authority and succession planning. Phase two was really in a, a thorough evaluation of our essential functions. What do we need to do to continue to provide that service and what resources do we need to make that happen? 
And then finally, phase three, which we're wrapping up now, looks at just some of the, um, the more minor tweaks to the plan, making sure we have good access and security plans and alert systems, communication tools in place. We're gonna wrap that project up in fiscal year 24 by um, exercising that new plan and doing some tabletop exercises. So I'm excited to see uh, how the plan refresh will impact our readiness in that exercise planning. Next slide. Um, we also have an annual, and this goes on the calendar year, we do an annual preparedness campaign for our staff internally each year. So our emergency coordinator provides, again, a lot of information to staff. We have information on our portal that uh, talks about everything from animal preparedness to fire emergencies and earthquakes. Um, so lots and lots of information provided to staff. And typically, we pick a topic each month, and we just flood as much information to the staff as we can so that they have the resources that they need to, to take their prepar preparation um, actions. So in calendar year 2022, we had a resolve to be ready campaign. And then uh, in January of 2023, we kicked off this calendar year's campaign, which was get ready, be ready. And that's ongoing and it will be through the end of this calendar year. In 2024, calendar year 2024, we'll have another one that we will kick off and continue those efforts. And then finally, um, Next slide, we have in fiscal year 24, we have some emergency preparedness initiatives that we are working on. Uh, we wanna formalize more of our emergency response plans and get a good thorough emergency operations plan in place. Uh, we do a lot of exercises currently, but we'd like to formalize a calendar to outline what the exercises are that we do each year. You know, I already mentioned things like the shakeout, but each fall we update our inclement weather plan and typically do an exercise related to that. So we do those things throughout the year, but we wanna formalize that plan a bit more. And then with battery electric buses coming, we've got some good training that needs to happen. Um, recently, our emergency coordinator and safety coordinator partnered together and provided some emergency response training for CNG buses, the compressed natural gas buses to Kaiser Fire Department and Marion County Fire District. And it was a hit. I mean, they they were really great participants in that. Um, and it, it went very well. And we wanted to build those relationships so that we can go back and do the same thing for battery electric bus before we put those buses into the service. So that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your report. Are there any questions for Manager Garcia? Please. Uh, thank you, President Davidson. Um, so when you had talked about, for one, thank you. This is a lot that you're doing. And I've um, gotten some some comments lately where there was an incident at a bus stop and before the individual could make a call there was already a supervisor responding to the incident so thank you for staying on top of that and your team for for staying on top of that uh, when you talk about organizing you know, some of these stakeholder meetings um, i just want to um, request that kaiser cert be involved um, I know that they had dissolved a, a while back because Marion County had kind of consumed all of the, the CERT activities. And um, our city manager, our new city manager, has uh, been really intentional about starting that back up. So I'd just like to make sure that they're part of that, that table. Thank you for bringing them up, Director Navarro, because we had not involved the CERT groups in the past and I wasn't aware how active Kaiser is. We are connected with them from an emergency management perspective, but I think that they bring a different perspective to the table. So I'll reach out and see if we can get someone to join us for that meeting. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And for those watching at home that might wonder what CERT is, it's Community Emergency Response Teams. Yes. Yeah. It's a volunteer organization. Other questions, please. Director Holmstrom. Thank you uh, for your report, and it's uh, you know, a lot of great information and, and detail here. Um, you know, a, a lot of charts and reports on um, incidents that were we responded to, or our consultant, our uh, contractors responded to, and I know, and you you talked about um, you know some of the actions that you're doing to kind of try to prevent these happening in the first place, right? Um, I I just think that's you know. 
you know, obviously what happens on our property or what happens on transit is kind of a reflection of the community, right? It's, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, not because we're transit, it's because it's part of the community. But I just, I want to make sure that we're, we're doing everything we can to kind of, you know, beyond just, you know, the security presence, which I think is important, um, to, to try to stop that from happening in the first place. I know sometimes it's not possible, but I, I appreciate all the work that you're doing, working collaboratively with other folks. Um, you know, just one space in particular, and you highlighted it a couple times, is that high street sidewalk. You know, it's such a permeable, I mean, the, there's a line there somewhere that's invisible <laughs> between where the transit center st stops and where the sidewalk begins. And um, just noise, activity, smoke, does not respect that line, and it's you know things that would be, you know, would be on this report and would have our security responding to over here is not the case. Just a few feet over, and uh, you know, that's that's troublesome sometimes. I think, and I don't know what to do about it. Um, but I, you know, I just encourage uh, the district to continue to work with the city and other partners to um, to think about uh, ways of. Uh, making it a, a pleasant experience for our, our customers, the people that ride the transit, as well as our operators and people who work here uh, on our facility. Appreciate that, all your work. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Director Holstrom. I, I was happy to hear you say that you too recognize that the problems that we experience here on transit are really a reflection of what's going on in the community. I think sometimes people don't see it that way. Um, transit doesn't attract problems. We just have the same problems as we're surrounded by. And um, it, it is unfortunate that we have the types of behaviors on high street sidewalk, but because of that jurisdictional boundary, it prevents us from taking action from our security staff or issuing exclusions like we would if it were on our property. So the best thing for us to do is to partner with the community to see what we can do together. And that doesn't just happen at my level. I know that um, General Manager Pollack and the directors and chiefs, everyone is working towards that effort because we see not only how much it impacts chariots, but when you've got kids darting out into the middle of High Street when traffic is coming, it's just scary, some of the behavior. And so anything that we can do to address that before something really serious happens, um, I feel like it's worth the effort to give it a try if we can prevent someone from getting hurt. So. General Manager Pollock, would you mind sharing just a little bit about some of the conversations you've had with the city about High Street? So, so, so thank you, yeah. So my conversations have been uh, with the city manager's office, city manager and her and his staff, uh, um, focusing on uh, you know, first educating the difference because uh, you know a lot of times people say those those folks over at transit, and, you know they're on the sidewalk, and if we had jurisdictional boundary, maybe we could do a little bit more. <coughs> so I've been talking about increased uh, presence by police. Their uh, downtown cleaning team, which they recently have gone through, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of times, but also longer term, how can we uh, maybe help ourselves? Can't solve all our problems, but uh, is there an opportunity uh, like we used to have when we had a temporary transit center around the block when this facility was closed? Uh, we were able to utilize our ordinance procedures to control some of the behaviors, and is that something possible on city? property if there's an MOU. So we're looking into those types of options, uh, but they take a little bit of time because there's legal issues involved. Yeah. Thank you for that context. Director Duncan? Uh, I had a, one question and a couple comments. Um, I'll leave with my question. Um, I know that we, when we originally contracted with PPC Solutions, we also talked about there being a certain amount of presence of ride-alongs and at stops. It wasn't reflected in the slide, so I just wanted to check, is that something we're still pursuing and working towards or actively have going on? Yes, Director Duncan, absolutely, we are hoping to do that. So, you know, anytime you start up a new contract, unfortunately, when Allied left, we only had one officer that remained on the site, and so they had to recruit totally from scratch. And when you start up a new contract, there tends to be a lot of turnover because they're trying to find staff that are the right fit, the contractor's trying to understand our needs, 
there's a number of different dynamics. So we've had a lot of people come in and out of the contract in this first 120 days, but I feel like we're fairly stable now and the numbers are starting to increase. Our first goal was to get the staffing that we needed at the transit centers. And then once we got everyone trained up and we had a good strong presence there, get officers riding in the system and put the mobile security into place that we've got in the contract. So we are still excited to do that. Um, I would love to have more security out there to help support the operators more. And uh, you commented, Director Navarro, about the operations supervisors responding to the shelters. And we appreciate everything that they do, but it's really a little bit outside of their primary role. We really want security to be able to step in um, and be able to support operations more than what we have in the past. So I'm looking forward to that mobile patrol getting in place myself. And you have the resources that we have control over to be able to move forward. I know you can't control all the staffing issues, but like from our from where we're coming from, you have the resources you need that we have control over. Right. From a contract standpoint, everything is in place. We're just waiting for Phoenix to be able to get the right staffing in place so that we can put those services to work. Great. Thank you for the clarification because I, I figured there was there's a reason and I, I don't know these things. So I appreciate you clarifying. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to highlight that I really appreciate you offering or, or requiring the de-escalation training for all public facing staff. As somebody who's, I, I used to be the like front desk clerk at a children's hospital, which you wouldn't think ha, has need of de-escalation, but it sure does. Um, and uh, I can say that that training is something that helped me feel safer in those situations because I at least knew what to do. And so I'm really happy to hear that we're going to be offering that for staff, and I think that's a great step forward. Um, and then I wanted to add a little bit to the high street conversation just as far as comments go, which is I think it's important to highlight there aren't a lot of places you can just exist in Salem. Um, we do have some parks and things like that, but as far as like places that you can just come and sit, the transit center is pretty attractive for that reason. There's a lot of seating and it's covered and um, that would definitely, if I didn't know where I was going to go and be for a little bit of time and I didn't want to walk all the way to the park, that would be where I would go. Um, and so I also think there's just kind of a natural flow of things that we're dealing with for that from that perspective. And I'm no expert, but just having lived in Salem, um, having spaces that people can just exist in in other places throughout downtown may help with some of that concentration. And that's just kind of a comment for the community at large. So thank you very much for all the effort you do. This is a lot, and I appreciate it. I have a great team, and they do a lot of work. <laughs> I, I used to be a department of one, and I'm very grateful that we have a number of coordinators now that really help with this. So thank you for helping support the growth of the department and supporting the contractors that we have in place. Absolutely. Director Carney. Thank you, uh, Director Davidson. I'm interested in, um, and I don't know that it's reflected in the reporting, but I don't know that it's not reflected in the reporting. Um, when I think of customer service um, and chariots, the first group I think of is our operators. And I'm wondering, um, at, I think it would be impossible to capture the, the customer service contacts that they have every day because they are probably so numerous. Um, just in terms of the help that they're offering and assistance, you know, this is your stop, that kind of thing. Um, but what of um, these kind of different security interactions have their origin on the bus and then sort of make their way into this set of data or is that a different set of data entirely? Like a hidden set of data. Does that does my question make any sense? Can you restate for me? I want to make sure I clearly understand. So of like the exclusions and warnings and ordinance warnings and incident reports, what subset of those numbers, if any, have the, you know, are an operator saying, hey, I need help with something or, um, you know, that kind of thing? At the transit centers, the operators, if something occurs on their bus, typically they report it in advance of re responding or arriving at the transit center. But if they witness something, you know, they leave their bus, they're on their way to the building for their layover period, they will knock on security's door or approach a security officer and report activity. Most of it, I believe, comes from the security officers observing the behavior and making the approach, but we do get quite a number of reports from not only transit operators, but the transit hosts are 
great at reporting things to the security staff. And uh, when it comes to behavior in the lobby and things going on in the lobby, the customer service staff are definitely our eyes and ears because they have their eyes on that lobby all day long so they can see who's loitering and, and who's engaging in behavior that we don't want in there. So we do receive a lot of reports from internal staff. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess maybe kind of also what I'm thinking is, um, you know, the, the downtown transit center is more or less a point location. The Kaiser Transit Center is a point location, but our service area is huge. You know, and there's no way for us to be everybody. So I guess I'm I'm more kind of interested, like, how does how do these numbers reflect the whole service area versus um, just these point locations? If I understand your question correctly, Director Kearney, I don't know if we are collecting that data. I mean, there's. If you look at everything that the transit operators are providing, it would I wouldn't be able to create a chart. No, it would be <laughs> Honestly. And, you know, we've never pulled all that together. I believe our customer service team, they collect information on customer service contacts, and so does the transit host program. Yeah. I don't believe that the operators do. If they do, I'm not aware of how we would collect that because it just happens all day long. Right. So the security staff is just a fraction of, of what's provided out there. Did yeah. you have something to add? I guess I would add, and it, Tom, maybe you can help me. Um, so the operators, if they have incidents out on their bus, they complete incident reports uh -huh. that are separate than these. These are safety and security. The, the, those happen all day, uh, every day. Uh, there are, I th and it's probably a small amount, but for instance, something happens on the bus, the operator calls ahead, hey, I'm heading to the transit center. Can security meet my bus? I have it and they, they just deal with it then. Whether that gets reported as a security security incident report, I don't know, okay. uh, but that does happen. But out in the field, it's operator-initiated incident reports, unless somebody actually arrives there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I mean. That, and that's a whole different number. Yeah. We do have that, but it's not yeah. part of this report. Gotcha. Uh, so to clarify, Director Kearney, I thought you were referring mostly to the customer service side. Mm -hmm. So if there are um, incidents, accidents, um, ordinance violations, the operators do submit those incident reports. And um, like General Manager Pollock indicated, if the operator reports that they need security to respond to the bus at, upon arrival, if the security initiates a report, it's included, even if it started on the bus. But if it started and ended out in the system and security did not participate, it's not counted in these numbers. Um, but I believe I shared um, when I was here at a previous meeting, we are currently implementing a new software tool to track all of our incident reports. So I believe that in the end, we will have a better way to report things that are initiated through operators and security. My hope, because this is just a snapshot of what's going on with security, um, it doesn't tell the whole story, and that's always been a problem for me because it's harder to analyze the need. So hopefully that software system will be able to report out the totality of everything incident-wise and we can really problem solve how to use that mobile service. We'll be able to see what routes, what days of the week, what times of the day we're having um, the greater numbers of, of problematic behavior so that we can use the security resources that we have in the contract to address where the problems are instead of just hoping we, we're in the right place at the right time. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's um, really great news and exactly the information I was looking for. Thank you. Sorry, it took me a couple minutes. To that's get okay. There. That's okay. I don't <laughs> think that my question asking was very clear. Um, and then uh, I had another question about um, relationship uh, and contract with the city of Salem and um, General Manager Pollock mentioned the the role of the clean team on the downtown transit mall and obviously we have an ongoing relationship with Salem City Police and I'm wondering if there's been any um, if, if there's any concern about a possible budget reduction for the city of Salem and not being able to you know Salem not being able to support those services, I mean, would that put us in a position of needing more private security or 
what what might be the outcomes um, if we don't pass a payroll tax in the city of Salem? Well, currently the city supports on city property, so they manage trash disposal and cleanup and response on the sidewalks. Of course, the law enforcement will respond to the transit center, but we're not getting any support for cleanup or anything like that on our property. We do that. Um, we have not historically taken the responsibility to do a lot of cleanup on the sidewalk, and we don't take enforcement because of the jurisdictional boundary there. Um, I think that we've already seen an impact on the downtown transit center in maybe or maybe not in money but in resources so the decline in um, the numbers of police officers on Salem police force has impacted their ability to respond and provide coverage throughout the community um, I do know that their staffing uh, did impact the relationship that we had with them because they just could not commit a full-time officer to be on call for us like they had previously been able to do so I think when you look at budget and community resources, even if it's not direct, indirectly, what we do impacts the community and what the community resources have, it impacts the transit. So uh, that's why we really want to work together to see what we can do. There might be one small thing that we could shift in our services or, or in our programs that would have a huge impact on a community partner. And until we all come to the table and have those discussions, we don't know what those opportunities are. Um, that's all I have, at least for now. So I'll, I'll pass the mic if anybody's going to pick it up. Thank you very much for the, the report. I enjoy it every time. You're welcome. Other questions, comments? Okay. I, I have just a few questions and probably some comments. Um, for the customer service contacts, I'm imagining those being responsive contacts where I go up to somebody and ask, me, writer, go, go up to a security officer and they are fielding a customer service contact at that point? Or does this data reflect proactive contacts as well? No, Director Davidson, you were correct. Okay. It's normally when a writer approaches us, what time does that route leave? What bus do I take to get to this destination? Great, thank you. Um, so I, I know for the purposes of, of this particular report, the incident reports that are flagged here are, relate specifically with the private security incident reports. And it sounds like we also do have staff reported incidents and perhaps we now are required to report that to the National Transit Database. And so my, I guess this is less of a question, more of a request that I would love to see quarterly updates to the board on those uh, physical assault and non-physical assaults to operators, uh, just so we as a board could be apprised of those issues. I know the Chariots as an organization is making concerted efforts to address that. Um, I think tracking data and understanding of data help, will help us make those good informed decisions. So that's my request there. Thank you. Um, the term trespass can be kind of a term of art. Um, in this particular context, is it safe to assume that trespass means that it's something after somebody has been excluded or there has been an exclusion placed? Yes, that okay. is correct. Or we ask someone to leave the property and they refuse. Got that it. would also be considered a trespass, but typically it's when someone's in violation of an exclusion. Great, thank you. The security committee, um, it's wonderful that this is not only not only exists but has been active for as long as it has. Could you help me better understand who within the Chariots organization is represented on the security committee? Absolutely. We have a 50-50 membership, so half of the members of the safety committee are um, represented staff and the other half are non-represented staff. So we have supervisors and managers and transit operators, facilities, people. Um, we've got a broad spectrum of, of staff on that committee. There are 10 in total, five and five, and that's outlined in the agency safety plan that we'll have a 50-50 um, committee. Uh, we also have three advisors to that committee. So I serve as an advisor, our safety coordinator serves as an advisor, and our risk manager also advises to that committee. Um, and then one person out of the 10 
chairperson committee is appointed as chair um, and facilitates meetings. So the safety committee, like I mentioned, is been a long-standing committee, but now we just have that second role of looking specifically at security incidents. That's great. Thank you. Does is the composition of that committee? Is it a self-selection, self-volunteering? Could you help me understand the process? So normally for non-represented staff, they volunteer or they're appointed okay. based on the role in their organization. And for represented staff, they are voted in by their peers to represent the represented staff on that committee. That's great to hear. And if I am a member of staff, however not a member of the security committee or the safety committee, do I have a, a formal venue to make my concerns heard before that committee? The committee members, part of their responsibility is to reach out to their coworkers and get feedback and concerns. We also um, have reporting tools, mostly on the safety side. We haven't formalized it as much on the security side because this role of that group is fairly new, but we have hazard reporting reports and things like that for the safety side that we can definitely incorporate to help bring information in from staff to the security committee meetings as well. Um, but we also look at incident reports. We look at a lot of policy that, that is occurring. Unfortunately, there are enough security incidents that we have an idea of what the trends are, and that's what the committee's focused on at this time, really kind of addressing the things that we're seeing on an ongoing basis that relate to security. Great. Thank you. Um, and last, I, I just want to say that I appreciate the systemic look that you and your team are t uh, taking with this. In particular, you you mentioned systems specifically when referring to that committee, and I, I think that's invaluable. Um, as others of my colleagues have noted, and you yourself have noted, that what we are witnessing today, I mean, public transit, I think is, I'm, ch I'm ch changing tracks now. Um, public transit is a microcosm of the public, and uh, it is, wonderful and challenging at the same time for that very same reason. Um, and so many of the societal issues that we collectively are facing are reflective in transit, but that's for many people the only time they're confronted by it. And um, I think that is one of the beauties uh, of public transit. So uh, that's all to say that that is a reflection of systemic issues. Um, there are multiple systems, there's community-wide systems, but there are also agency systems and so i just really want to appreciate uh, extend my appreciation to you for thinking systemically so thank you thank you other questions or comments please um thank you director davidson i am wondering um you know i'm sort of looking at our entire packet all 713 pages of it um <laughs> And, you know, thinking about the Title VI report that we received just a, a little bit ago, um, I'm wondering how the demographic makeup of, you know, our, our whole body of security officers reflects our community. I know, let me, let me start by saying, and I meant to, um, I know last year when you were here, um, we talked about uh, Spanish language access and people who were bilingual as part of that um, group, and, and and you talked a little bit. So I was just kind of thinking, you know, maybe in addition to language access or um, bilingual individuals uh, filling those roles, is does it look representative um, or? Is that not the case? Director Kearney, I think we're getting there. I don't know if we reflect the community as well as I hope we can at some point, um, but we do have male and female officers. We've got a variety of different age groups represented on the security team. Um, we opened it up for eligibility for the contractors to have a variety of different skills and backgrounds from corrections to law enforcement, military, private security. So we've got a variety of different backgrounds there too. Um, we do have a, a couple of officers who are bilingual. So I think as we add more officers, we'll be able to increase the diversity of that team as well. That would be good news, thank you. 
Manager Garcia, thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Next up, we have our final informational report of the evening dealing with battery electric buses. I'll ask our Chief Operations Officer, Tom Dietz, to present the report. Good evening, Vice President Davidson, members of the board. Um, Greg's on vacation, so I'm pinch hitting for me, so <laughs> surprise. Uh, so, yeah, to just bring you up to speed on where we're at with the battery electric bus. Um, and I, I changed uh, the first picture of Greg's from the catalog image to a Chariot's BEB caught in the wild. So that was the, the first BEB to roll off the line in Livermore, California. Um, so I can tell you without too much of a spoiler alert, we're so close you can feel the electricity. It, not a dumb wow. one, but... <laughs> Boo! <laughs> <laughs> I have more. Uh, so just kind of a recap. Uh, this is old news, even for old news. So um, we, the chariots uh, submitted for a Lono grant in 2015. Uh, we were not successful. Um, so we continued to work and uh, applied for and received a uh, pretty amazing back-to-back -back LONO awards in fiscal 20 and fiscal 21 uh, for a total of 10 battery electric buses. In addition, uh, Chariots was then awarded a congressionally directed spending grant for an additional five. So those uh, will be going into production soon. So we'll have those um, in about 18 months, 20 months uh, is a lead time on that. Uh, so uh, we have a, a number of partners, and I'll get to a slide where um, I can brag on them as, as um, much as you'll allow. Um, so we partnered with uh, ChargePoint uh, for plug-in charging at Dell Webb. Um, so, and th these pictures, I'm gonna refer to these a lot, so um, seal these two images in your brain because I'll go back to them. Uh, up there you'll see uh, four little refrigerator looking boxes uh, and then one that looks like um, your standard uh, EV plug-in charger. So those are distribution blocks. So when I say power block or distribution block, those are what I'm referring to. Um, one of those distribution blocks powers two dispensers. So um, you'll, you'll, it'll make sense in a minute. Uh, and then we also have partnered with, uh, well, we started with Momentum Dynamics and they changed their name to Induct EV uh, for inductive pickup infrastructure at Kaiser. So what you see there is a marketing image, but um, uh, you'll, you'll get the real deal here in just a second. So here are our Chariot's partners and I will apologize in advance if I have neglected anyone, um, but I think I got most of them. Uh, but. You know, you see up there, of course, Gillig uh, for the actual bus, Cummins for the batteries, uh, and then we've got PGE, which uh, they've just been incredible partners, and we're in their partner program up at Kaiser uh, for the charging infrastructure at Kaiser. Salem Electric uh, for our power needs at Dell Webb, and of course, Induct EV ChargePoint. And our contractors, um, uh, CTE, the consultants that are helping us through uh, all of this. And then the actual contractors, J.H. Uh, Kelly for work up at Kaiser and uh, EC Electric for work at Dell Web. So where are we at so far? So uh, we did a bus procurement, um, check that box. Uh, the buses were built uh, and delivered uh, in, or they started arriving in June of this year. And right now we have all 10 of them on property. And I gotta say, they look amazing. So just, I wanted to show you this because this is kind of a peek behind the curtain. Um, so this is the actual build. That is our first bus um, going down the line. Uh, and Seth Hamlin uh, was living it up in an imaginary driver's seat and then uh, almost a driver's seat. Uh, and then there's the bus uh, just outside the plant at the charging, uh, at the charger uh, where all the team was there and they got to go on their first ride. So now, uh, fast forward to uh, just last month, uh, construction at Kaiser Transit Center started. 
uh, and it is taking shape. So I have lots of pictures. Uh, so Kaiser Transit Center um, is a very familiar uh, aerial view there. You'll see, it's very difficult to see, but you see the, the bus stop icons all around the island. Um, but the lower right hand three, you'll see have little yellow dots on them. Those will be the inductive pickup pads um, at those, uh, it's bay uh, E, F, and G, if you're familiar with that. Uh, so it went from what you see on the left to trenching. So we had trenching and line boring going on um, and they have really done tremendous work in a short period of time. So now you see, uh, this is obviously less glamorous than the marketing photo of the inductive <laughs> charging pad. Um, but what you see here is a charging pad uh, in the ground. Uh, each one of those squares um, represents a 75 kilowatt per hour charger. So all four of them, when the bus kneels all the way down to uh, create the magnetic field, 300 kilowatts per hour uh, will be charging uh, the vehicle. And each pad is uh, supplied by 12 conduit. Uh, so it, it is quite, quite a sight to see. You can see as you navigate around there, you've got the, the 90 degree sweeps that are going under the drive apron to the charging pad hole, and then the stub ups where the cabinets will go. So what's next? Um, so we'll finish uh, construction at Kaiser Transit Center should be uh, done in December of this year. We are approximately, and I don't wanna uh, say it too loudly, but we're about a week and a half and some change ahead of schedule at um, Kaiser. So the one that I, the picture I showed you with the pad in the ground, um, that was, that picture is two weeks old. And right now all three locations are backfilled and ready for concrete. We were uh, scheduled to set the last pad on October 12th. We're ahead of schedule. So that's, that's great news. So the plan was to energize, um, energize KTC the week of December 18th. So um, right now with, with our schedule and UL testing and certification and um, signing off, uh, we have to make sure that we're not too, too far ahead of schedule, otherwise we'll get to turn the power on but can't do anything because they're not inspected. So um, right now that is set for that week uh, in December. Uh, so construction at Del Webb, uh, if, notice that's capitalized, so if construction begins on 10-1, it will be 24 weeks uh, to complete. So that would put us um, end of March, mid-April to be done and able to charge at Del Webb. Uh, and then that would put us at revenue service at the May service change. Uh, that's kind of the official big push, but as as we get chargers online and we're able to use them, uh, we can roll buses out into service as we, as we get them charged. So there's a picture of Del Webb and I, I was gonna be real clever and say that's the before picture and the after picture because nothing's, nothing's <laughs> occurred there. Um, but I did wanna show you kind of the, you know, I, I recall bringing a couple of times um, information to the board about a land use issue that we're working through uh, with the city of Salem. Um, so just to give you an idea of, this is the picture of Del Webb uh, in the daytime where you see um, the bus wash and the fuel island, so lower, uh, lower middle part of the screen. Ah, thank you, my pointer doesn't work. There, yes, yeah, so that will become Electric Avenue where you see uh, those seven buses. Those will all be energized and uh, have dispensers on them uh, and power running to them. So what we're working through is um, the land use issue on the property just north of, our, of, of the Del Webb Operations Headquarters. Uh, and then where you see what, um, it is not a regional airport, it may look like that, but so there's uh, the, the soil disturbance um, that will happen is in that little kind of runway setup, looking setup. Uh, so trenching will go east to west all along Electric Avenue. Uh, and then the uh, line boring from Salem Electric from the transformer from the southeast, southwest to the northeast 
um, where Salem Electric will tie it into a closed loop to the substation, which is also owned by Salem Electric, uh, which is just out of the frame of the picture. And completing the loop so that uh, if we had, if we lost power on the south side of the property where the power enters the property, um, we could then flip a switch, we being Salem Electric, and then we would get power from the substation, so still be able to charge. Uh, and then we're working on uh, the backup generation, what that's going to look like for the CNG stations as well as the BEBs. So remaining steps, uh, as I, I've kind of already alluded to, uh, the uh, KTC con uh, construction will be complete and then energize the infrastructure. Uh, Del Webb will have that construction begin, um, hopefully uh, this, this coming next month. Um, what we've got is um, the technicians are currently being trained by, by um, Gillig staff, but we have more training coming, a lot more training coming. Um, operator instructor training should be um, starting uh, at, towards the middle of next month. And then, of course, operator training as we get closer to being able to charge. So we do have a portable charger uh, that we got. We can charge one bus in a day. Uh, it's, it's a little charger compared to what, um, what the dispenser and the power blocks will do. Um, but uh, maintenance has come up with a plan that uh, starting Friday, they can charge a bus and they'll have four buses ready to roll on Monday for operator training because it will take um, a significant amount of energy to go through an operator training. Uh, the, so uh, the operator training will get uh, closer probably in January. We'll, we'll start that in earnest because um, we'll have a service change and then we'll have another service change. So. We're gonna start with the Route 11 operators and then all of the extra board, um, vacation relief and regular relief drivers. Uh, and then once those are done, then we'll train the rest of the roster. So we'll have 100% of the roster trained on BEBs. Um, and it is a, it, it, this training is very serious. Um, these buses do not behave like a CNG or a diesel bus. Um, it's, it's real time power. Um, just like if you have an EV car and you put your foot to the floor, it goes. Um, I, one of the team that was down at the, at the um, at that bus right there said that they showed him what it could do, and it chirped the tires on a 40-foot bus when he when he um, hit the accelerator, um, which was both amazing and terrifying all at the same time. So, um, but for the record. Um, the Gillig staff has detuned um, everything three times now to get it down manageable so that we're not um, running into even accidental um, uh, challenges in the aisle if, if we, if we um, brake too hard or, or um, accelerate too hard. But I digress. So we have emergency response training, and uh, my colleague um, mentioned that. So we're going to be having... Uh, First responder training for both, e, uh, you know, law enforcement um, for other issues, but for fire uh, response uh, on a battery electric bus, it is different. So we'll be um, collaborating on that. Um, data collection training, so that's route validation, the seeing if the modeling works, um, how close to the nameplate range are we going to be uh, versus. Um, what we have, you know, what we actually have. So we're going to be doing a whole range of tests from uh, dead weight ballast testing to uh, we want to run the bus on the route, stopping, starting, kneeling, raising, merging traffic, picking up people, dropping people off, uh, and see how it how it goes. Um, that's real life testing, and that I think will get us kind of real real information, and then pull that from the from the computer that's on board the system, so we have um, real uh, real data that we'll be able to collect. Um, and then uh, project closeout, which I cannot wait to get to that stage. I've never looked more forward to doing weekly and monthly quarterly reports, but that means we're actually rolling these buses. And I, honestly, I just can't wait to get these buses on the street. That, um, that paint scheme is amazing. When it's going down the road, it, it just looks, it looks like it's electric. Mm -hmm. So uh, this one, uh, before I get to the questions part, that's so trust but verify. There are the 10 buses in a line, uh, patiently waiting to uh, serve the Salem area. Uh, and then the Route 11 will get a little bit of a uh, extra jewelry, I guess. Um, so each bus stop will replace the blue standard international, this is a bus stop sign with a zero emissions corridor 
bus stop topper. Uh, so, and with that, that concludes the, the update. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief Operating Officer Dietz. Any questions for him? Let me rephrase that. Who would like to go first? <laughs> Director Carney. All right. Um, well, that, that was a wild ride, that presentation. <laughs> I, was, I was excited. I was happy. There were times I was mildly terrified. Um, and I also, the the distribution blocks look a lot like a dehumidifier that I have in my basement, so you might you just double check that <laughs> when they get here. Um, so my question, and maybe you guys all have this covered, but growing up, my dad taught me that a lot of stuff is cool to DIY, but <laughs> hire an electrician. So I have a healthy fear of electricity, and this picture of all these big wires in the ground um, gave me some concerns. Do we have, as a district, the ability to kind of like de-energize things in a hurry? Should do we ever have need to? So thank you for the question, Director Carney. Um, yes and no. So we will have emergency shutoffs at the cabinet, which will be uh, immediately kind of adjacent the bus stops at each one of the um, uh, bays at Kaiser. But if it was a, a catastrophic sort of failure, that would be a Salem Electric shutdown. Um, okay. The whole transformer would have to be shut down. Um, there are certain fail-safes uh, already in the equipment, um, but if it were something large scale, we'd, we'd involve the professionals. And we'd call um, a PG, sorry, um, who could uh, de-energize. Super. Okay, that um, that answers that. I'm still scared of electricity. Um, I also I want to say these zero emissions bus toppers on the what do we call it? Which quarter? The green quarter, electric quarter. Electric, electric bus quarter. I love them. I can't wait to go ride. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I have to give a shout out to the marketing team, uh, Jonah Hansen's design. Director Holmstrom. Thank you. So I think my, my main burning question is, when does the board get to ride uh, one of these things? <laughs> or drive. Or, or the, drive. I've yeah. heard the tires chirp. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we could certainly arrange any time that, that uh, any member of the board would like to come out. Um, I know we had a bunch of curious operators just this afternoon that said, can have the keys to the car, and um, they did get to go for a, a spin in the bus uh, on property. So, anytime. Very exciting. So, uh, excited also that we're going to get um, apparently some inductive charging for Christmas. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, the Odell Web charging, it says if it starts by this Sunday, how, how certain is that? Do you think that we're, I mean, that's a couple days away we're talking about here. So, it's, it's unknown at this point, so unknown. very unlikely. Okay. I'll say bank on it. It won't happen on Sunday. Gotcha. So we're still talking weeks, months. So once uh, once the city of Salem releases our permit, it'll take a week to um, to uh, muster the contracting crew, uh, and then we can start. Um, we have um, we'll have uh, as a part of our monitoring plan. Um, a qualified archaeologist monitoring all soil disturbance activities, uh, and that should take three weeks. So by Thanksgiving, we should have some trenches done. If, if uh, everything happens. So, I mean, realistically, we could say the 16th of October, but I, I don't want to put anything in ink right now. I, I appreciate that. It's already taken, I think, longer than everyone expected. So um, unexpected things happen when you're digging the dirt. So um, I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Director Navarro. Thank you, President Davidson. So, or Vice President Davidson. <laughs> I have been getting that wrong all night. Um, I don't know if we can pull up the slide from the Dell Webb station. So in, in that slide, um, you talked a little bit about Electric Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just trying to get a better picture of where these 
dehumidifier, <laughs> things are going to go. And, uh, and where the, the buses are going to be parked, are they going to be under the cover, are they going to be out in the exposed uh, elements and, and plugged in? It's okay, so we'll get to that picture, third from the last slide. There we go. Uh, go back one. Okay, so um, I, I, I say go back to this one, Director Navarro, because it's actually more zoomed in. So where you see seven buses, right where uh, the cursor is right there, the buses will be backed in just like that. The uh, charging dispensers will be along the sidewalk that's right at the tail of every bus. Um, uh, Greg had spec'd the buses so that we could charge from either right or left side, so it doesn't matter if, it, if the charger's occupied or, or whatnot. Um, the transformer will go to the northwest corner of the bus wash and it will feed the switch gear, will be attached to the building, and then the um, distribution blocks uh, will be in, in, in two rows that will run east to west just on the north side of the bus wash. That was very convoluted if my pointer worked. So, right, go to your, uh, go to the west a little bit in the picture. So right there. So in that area right there, you'll see all the distribution blocks. And so we will have um, six distribution blocks. So they will feed 12 dispensers. Oh, wow. And then we'll get more as we get new buses delivered. Awesome. Thank you. Director Holmstrom. So yeah, just to follow up on that. So I assume that there's conduit that's being installed for future dispensers and, and distribution yes. blocks for future okay yes. so we will have all of um, so thank you that's an excellent point so the conduit will go under the sidewalk all the way from the far um, from the first bus stall on the west all the way to the last stall on the east uh, and that so we'll only have 10 buses we'll have 12 dispensers in ground but we'll have the conduit run so that we can um, just stub up um, the remaining chargers to fill out um, what I'm calling Electric Avenue. Once we get the other buses, like the, the ones down the road, um, we'll have to look at where we're going to put those because Electric Avenue will be filled. And then we'll have um, probably the need, uh, from what I'm told, the need for another transformer because that'll be as much as that transformer can feed. Does that help answer your question about where they'll be? Um, first, a comment from me. The, I'm, I, I think I've heard this before, but I am still shocked that the induction charging can do 300 kilowatts. Like that is DC level charging at a you know Electrify America location, like top of the line, high speeds. My, to give you pers some people perspective, my Chevy Bolt can only accept 55 kilowatt. So like, it just can't even accept 300 kilowatts. So. I guess that leads me to a question, though, which is how much can our buses accept? And I recognize that this might be a great question, and you're in the hot seat, but. So he can smack me later. But um, those, the, the, re the receiving pads on the bottom of the bus can receive all 300 kilowatts. Really? Um, but um, it will, so I, I say that in that it doesn't like throw the switch and you get all of it right away so okay. it ramps up and it sure. there's a sweet spot that it yeah. gives you kind of max power and then as it gets to like i know 60%. i'm going to say this wrong 85 percent it yeah. starts to slow down because you don't want to boil um, right. anything in there um so then it, it slows back down so what we're learning i mean we're learning already uh we haven't put a bus on those chargers obviously yet but um the gillig technicians say you don't want to when you finish your loop, park it and charge it. You don't want to do that. You want to right. get it down um, to a state of charge much lower than what we're probably going to be at when we come through there. So um, it's it's changing the way we're kind of how we're going to do that. We're not going to really know until we do those tests. So we want to run the loop in mm -hmm. real kind of life uh, performance and go to KTC and see where we're at and then run it again and see where we're at and run it again and then see how far we can go before we uh, have to put it on the charger. Right, okay, 
And then for the at Dell Web, the plug-in chargers, do you happen to know what the output is? 150 kilowatts in it. Okay, that's more of what I was expecting. I am, wow, okay. I, I recognize that the induction charging, we won't be there very long. It's just like a holdover period, but that, that is remarkable. Um, so two, I guess one, one comment is that I would have loved for, you know, the ribbon cutting to have happened months ago. I think all of us would have. Um, but I, I do just want to appreciate and acknowledge the thoughtful and deliberative process that you, your team, and everybody else is taking with this. I'd much rather have us do it right than do it quickly. And you all are doing that very well. So kudos to you all. Thank you. Um, in a... So uh, President Enos Pressey will almost certainly have asked this question if she were present. And uh, this may be a, a chief communication officer Feeney question, but will there be Lego buses of the battery electric bus when there is a ribbon cutting? Uh, that will be a question that sh she will ask, I, I imagine, at her next meeting. And then um, in a similar vein, does the color green have a name like thunder blue like, is there, a, is there a colorful, like, something I can sink my teeth into? Cricket. Yeah. Eco green with... Vice President Davidson, there is a name for it, okay. but the fact that we started the rebrand in 2016, I don't think that my 59-year-old mind can comprehend right now where that color is, but I will send you an email first thing in the Thank morning. Thank you. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Could you CC Director Carney? <laughs> I don't want to do preferential treatment, so I'll send it to all of you. <laughs> Very sensible. So any further questions or comments? Okay. Chief Operating Officer Dietz, thank you very much. Uh, next, General Manager Pollock, your report. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. I do have a few items to report. Uh, first is uh, TransDash related. As you know, we are one of the uh, originating members of the TransDash program. Uh, in, along with Lane Transit District. I am uh, happy to say uh, we received the announcement that TriMet is joining TransDash. Hey. So all three transit districts in Oregon will be a part of the, the program, which will allow for some friendly competition <laughs> as we look at uh, uh, the reports. Uh, uh, so more to come on that as they sign on. They haven't, they've, they've made the commitment and they're going through the process. Uh, it is time again for the Oregon Travel Study. So if you're not familiar with that, that happens uh, once per decade. And it's a survey of Oregon households uh, that helps provide critical data for transportation policy decision makings and investments in local and state and federal levels. Uh, the goal really is to uh, uh, send out surveys to about half the households in the state of Oregon. Uh, and uh, those that complete the study will be compensated with the uh, travel, the debit card. So if that is exciting to you, please fill it out. Uh, so why are we doing this? Well, we're doing that because transportation planners and policymakers will use the data over the next 10 years uh, to create safer, more sustainable, and equitable transportation systems for all users throughout the state. Uh, the results should be published in 2025. And so if you receive a survey or if your friends or neighbors ask you because you're on the transit board, what's this travel study, please encourage them to participate. Uh, uh, the more information, the better. Uh, so last month, uh, we shared with you that uh, uh, Chariots uh, received the Sustainability Award at the Marion County Sustainability Summit. Uh, and. Uh, uh, unbeknownst to us, we received a uh, congratulations letter from Falk Ambulance, mm -hmm. uh, a partner that we're not really affiliated with, uh, congratulating us on that. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I'll use their words. Your recognition speaks volumes about your dedication, innovation, and commitment to excellence. And testament to hard work and passion you've invested in your business uh, for your customers and colleagues. And so, yeah, interesting uh, acknowledgement. So I thought I would share that with the board. 
Um, earlier today, I sent you all uh, the announcement, uh, the employee announcement of our new Chief Human Resources Officer, uh, Hayal Rose. Uh, she starts on Monday, uh, and you'll get to meet her at the work session. Uh, we're excited to have her on. Uh, she has extensive experience in HR, employee relations, organizational development, uh, and, and employment. Uh, so we're looking forward to, to her being on because that rounds out our executive leadership team. Uh, and we'll be fully staffed and ready to move the organization forward. And you also received your uh, talking points uh, flyer for this month. I just want to highlight that uh, uh, next week is Customer Service Appreciation Week. So if you make your way through the, the downtown transit center, please stop in and recognize our customer service reps uh, for the job that they do each and every day. They are one of the faces of chariots uh, to thousands of people every year. So uh, uh, please take time to thank them. Uh, we are also conducting our customer satisfaction and community value surveys in October uh, as part of our strategic planning process. Uh, so if you're riding the bus and you see a survey taker, that is why they're on the bus. And uh, also beginning next week is the Get There Challenge. Uh, to encourage people to use alternative transportation. So uh, if you are biking or teleworking or anything other than driving your vehicle by yourself, uh, please make sure you're enrolled and, and record your uh, alternative transportation uh, dates. Uh, and with that, that concludes my report. Thank you, General Manager Pollock. Uh, next, we'll go ahead and move to board member committee reports. Um, Director Navarro, would you kick us off? Absolutely. Um, so at the end of last month, I got to attend a 50th anniversary for the um, Colegio Cesar Chavez, which was in Mount Angel, um, which is really awesome. It was a precursor to Hispanic Heritage Month, which I really appreciated because it's a, a piece of history, of Oregon history, that doesn't really get talked about a lot. And this was a, a college that was a, a, a Latino-focused college uh, built by farm workers in Mount Angel um, that helped create a bunch of the leaders that helped champion initiatives here in the state of Oregon. Um, it, it no longer exists, but um, they had an anniversary to honor the creators of the college and the history of the college and share that with, um, with the rest of the community so that we never forget uh, how much that, that little piece of history contributed. Uh, to the rest of Oregon. And then uh, right after that, we got to attend the Hispanic Heritage Month breakfast um, with General Manager Pollock and Director Duncan, um, which was really awesome. I was kind of hoping that we had the picture um, that we had taken. I had a, a charro outfit, so my dad's from Jalisco, Mexico. That's uh, the heart of the uh, mariachis. And so I got to wear a uh, authentic um, uh, charro outfit uh, to that event, which was really awesome. It was really cool to be in community with a bunch of different folks and kind of share our, her our heritage. Um, and then after that, I attended the Coffee with Kathy the very next day, where we got to sit and have a round table with ju just a bunch of different electeds and appointed uh, representatives of Kaiser. Uh, we were joined by DJ Vincent from Church at the Park, where he got to talk to us a little bit about his work um, getting a, a youth shelter up and running. And he expressed how much he appreciated Chariots as a partner in that. So um, just a little tidbit of information and appreciation. Uh, the next announcement uh, for Kaiser, I just wanted to remind folks that school is back in session. Children are everywhere. Um, where I've been seeing a lot of youth ridership on the buses in Kaiser, um, and there's also been a lot of close calls, so I just like to remind everyone to be cautious at the stoplights because not all cyclists are stopping and walking their bikes through the crosswalks. Um, you don't want to, to have an accident or get a ticket and that be your first interaction with Kaiser's new police chief. So, <laughs> see how I did that? <laughs> um, so, we, uh, I, got, I got to sit on a committee to uh, interview the, a new police chief for the city of Kaiser. And I think that we made the great choice in picking uh, Lieutenant Copeland, now Chief Copeland, uh, to lead the police force in Kaiser. Uh, Lieutenant Copeland, now Chief Copeland, has, I've known him since I was in high school. And yeah, a long time. And he's just never 
Uh, I know sometimes they say it's bad to never change, but he has never changed. He's always been a kind and caring person. He's always been dedicated to his community and uh, committed to his job. And so uh, I think that he's going to make a great chief, and I wish him the best. And I want to say thank you to Chief Teague and all the hard work that he did um, before leaving the city of Kaiser. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Nevado. Uh, Director Carney. Uh, thank you, Director Davidson. I love your board member reports. Thank you. <laughs> um, Let's see. School is back in. I am so relieved uh, to have two children in Salem Kaiser's public school system. Um, if you guys are listening, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, this last month, I did attend the Grant Neighborhood Association, uh, and I read from my notes. And they were really excited about punks in the park. And um, in fact, I did see some of my neighbors there. And I think they published it on they, the Grant Neighborhood Association has a web page as well. And so they put that information up there. Um, I was out of town for the NEN Neighborhood Association. Um, and I still, I have to clarify, they're on my calendar, I think, twice a month. And I need to figure out how many times I need to show up if at all. <laughs> There's a lot of Nen going on. Um, but I attended the Punks in the Park Festival and saw our chariots booth there. And I just have to say that was an amazing event. It just, it was, um, it was so inclusive of our community. I mean, it really brought together, uh, you know, all different kinds of people, families, kids, and, um, you know, to your comment earlier, Director Duncan, about no place to go. I was I was talking to a friend um, the next day, and he had gone as well with his kids and his family. Um, and you know, we were talking about it, and he was like, "God, you know, I remember when I was when I was 19 years old. That was me. You know, I was I was hanging out here or smoking cigarettes there, and I just had nowhere to go." I had no place where I felt like I belonged. And it was just so awesome to see those kids there totally rocking out. There was a free clothing closet for youth. And then right across from that, there was like an alterations booth. They were like cutting off sleeves and putting on pins. And it was really cool. Anyway, um, then the next weekend, we went to the Latino Festival. Um, before it started raining in uh, the waterfront park. And that was um, awesome and awesome music. Um, and then this morning, uh, we got together early and attended the legislative breakfast. Uh, so that was, and that was a lot of fun too, connecting with folks. Um, and then next week, I will attend the Safe Routes to School event on October 4th at Grant um, with some other parents and community partners. Um, and then earlier this week, um, the SCATS Policy Committee met on Tuesday. And um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Director Azum and uh, Manager French for helping me prep for that meeting um, and for being on during the meeting because we were able to do some really like lightning fast communication um, in real time in response to some project work that was being presented. Um, we had planned to discuss the MPO voting structure at the meeting, but at the request of the city of Salem, that conversation was tabled until October, November. Yeah, yeah. They decided to table it till November because a uh, county commissioner could not make it in October. Uh, I think Mayor Hoy. Uh, Mayor Hoy uh, wanted to table it until October, but Commissioner Cameron could not attend in October, so I believe they pushed it to November gotcha. for that reason. Thank you. Um, Director Duncan is uh, my substitute <laughs> for the SCATS Policy Committee, and I did have to step away um, just at the very end of the meeting. But while I was there, uh, they did... We had a presentation from DKS um, consultants on a Cordon Road Boulevard um, and improvements that we, they're hoping to 
to see on that corridor. Um, and I can't say that as a transit fan, bike riding fan, fan I use my feet to get place, I'm totally wild about the proposed improvements. Um, but they are improvements on what is right now a a pretty dangerous corridor and one that is not uh, bike or pedestrian friendly at all. And there was just some interesting statistics in their presentation. Um, every additional driveway, this is their data, I'm not sure where they got it. Every additional driveway into, I suppose, like a transportation thoroughfare, or maybe it's something that's like classed the way Cordon Road is, every additional driveway increases crash risk by 4%. So I don't even know how, like, what is that? Like, so if you have, you're nodding your head, but like if I have 10 driveways, does it go up by 40%? And then if I have 20, is that 80? Like at some point I'm like over 100% crash rate. I don't know what happens there. It must level off at some point. Um, undivided arterial roadways like that one have a 55% higher crash risk than those with a raised median. Interesting, fun fact, or not fun fact. Um, and then this, I was kind of like, well, why are we taking them out? Every additional driveway per mile reduces travel speeds by 2.5 miles per hour. I was like, well, I feel like we're coming at from different sides here. Maybe we, I like them driving slow. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in culmination to this, all these facts, uh, they said there's only over 200 private driveways in the study area along Cordon Road, Kubler Road, and Hazel Green Road. So this study corridor is just like right it's the entire length of the city. Um, and in some locations, they're less than 75 feet apart. So these are part of the problems they're trying to solve. And I think we're a ways out on implementation, um, but I'm hoping they can do a little course correction in terms of providing sidewalks on both sides so that we can provide transit at any point um, and run a route along there and that we, um, they're limiting some places where you can make left turns and access cordon and so I certainly wouldn't want to put us in a situation where we were having to like go down something and turn, you know, that that won't work well for transit at all. And um, staff did submit comments to the project team that reflected that. Um, unfortunately, in our conversation with the policy committee, the consultants said that they had consulted with transit and they didn't have any stops on Cordon Road. And they didn't plan to put in put any on Cordon Road. And I was like, I did. Um, excuse me, I'm looking at the comments that staff submitted. So. The record has been corrected for DKS, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Carney. Before I move on to Director Duncan, just want to flag that I, my understanding is that both the county and the city have that corridor designated as either a park lane, parkway or something else where actually transit stops are just precluded. Mm. It's maybe. I, I believe that that has impacted our planning for Route 22, um, and mm. so would you like to correct me, Manager French? I'll just say that the Kubler uh, Road section that is is categorized that way is outside of the study area. So 36th uh, Avenue on the south end uh, is the end of the study area on Kubler. Uh, in the our comments uh, were to change that so that in the future on the Cordon Road corridor from 36th to Hazel Green that we would be able to provide service and transit and in the study they um, on Hazel Green Road which is the city's portion of that roadway uh, they've put uh, sidewalks and the infrastructure on both sides and from uh, I think Highway 22 to 30, 36th uh, include sidewalks on both sides of the plan, but in the county section, uh, they did not include it. They put everything on one side of the road, which was contrary to what we had asked uh, for them to include. Thank you for that. Director Duncan, would you like to make your report? Thank you, Vice President Davidson. Uh, so yeah, 
I, uh, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee did not meet uh, in anticipation of the new HR officer, and so uh, we are looking forward to hopefully meeting in October and be able to include that include them. I'm very excited to meet them. Um, MWACT uh, had a one more act meeting where we were really finalizing our feedback that we're going to be presenting to the greater um, committee and then also to ODOT. Um, feeling really excited about that. Actually, there's been a lot of really good collaboration on it. I do feel like Transit's priorities have been well reflected and echoed by other members of the group. Um, I'm just really hopeful that ODOT takes those and you know runs with it <laughs> all the way, <laughs> and that would be fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what um, everybody else has to say about it uh, on the on the committee. Um, and just continuing with going forward with that, I believe we'll, we have more, uh, quite a few more meetings before, I think, January when we finalize, um, if I'm getting those dates correct. Uh, I attended a Special Districts Association of Oregon Ethics Training. It was great. Presenter was hilarious. Um, and I've got some fun little tidbits for you guys to take home later from the packet that I think everyone would benefit from. Talked a little bit about some minor uh, like law updates about things that are on us that weren't before. Um, so I'll hand those out to you guys later. Um, and then I attended the Hispanic Heritage Breakfast. I am also sad that we didn't bring the photo because you looked amazing. Multiple people stopped you to compliment what you were wearing. It was fantastic. Maybe have a photo for later? OK. Um, and I just had a great time. Uh, the speaker was really quite compelling, which I wasn't, um, I wasn't sure if it would be. But it was, it was a great presentation, like truly one of my favorite presentations I think I've seen at a city breakfast in a really long time. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit um, in uh, relation to the scats. Oh, there we were go. we've got outfit photos. Great. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, the Cordon Road, not necessarily Cordon Road exactly, because I think uh, Director Carney really covered it well. But uh, I was perusing my local neighborhood boards on Facebook, and there was a complaint about people speeding in school zones now that school has started up again. Uh, particularly, the difference between 20 miles an hour and 30 miles an hour can make a really big difference in the fatality if an accident were to occur. Um, and I was thinking about the school zone that's closest to me, and that school is at the bottom of a large hill. And it is a wide, flat road. I mean, well, not flat. It's a wide road, and you really come careening down that hill, and there are absolutely no slowdown measures instituted in that area to force drivers to slow down. Um, and reading through the comment section, a lot of community members were suggesting placing a police officer pretty much in perpetuity to sit there and ticket people. And uh, this made me think of the Cordon Road project, because one of the criticisms that Director Carney had was that there were no natural slowdown measures. We do have the, um, the, the, the median that they talked about. But beyond that, um, there's no curves in the road. There is no na uh, narrowing, natural narrowing to the road. We didn't talk anything about reducing speed limits. We did talk about widening, which would lend to faster speeds rather than slower speeds. And when we think about, um, we talked a little bit about the, um, the budget shortfalls we have with the Salem Police Department. And when we're making these types of decisions, what we're deciding is, is this going to be a long-term ongoing expenditure to control a situation? Or can we, from when we're doing the infrastructure project from the very beginning, create natural solutions that will prevent us from having very expensive ex solutions into the future? And as a city who is going to be contending with these budget shortfalls for a long time, infrastructure can be an answer. And if that area that I'm thinking of, the school district near me, had you know, thought about people going and speeding through a school district, we may not have gotten to the point where we're thinking about per permanently placing a human there to ticket people, which means they have to be speeding to begin with before they can even give them that ticket, which means kids are already at risk. Um, so I know that it feels sometimes like what we do here is a little dry, uh, but it is incredibly important. It does actively impact the lives of our committee, of our community, and beyond that, the way that we like function as a, as the city of Salem, and a lot about where your tax dollars go in the long term. I don't know about you, but I would love it if we can use those dollars as intelligently as possible, so we have single um, high impact expenditures rather than smaller ongoing ones. And that's my my two cents for the night. So thank you. Thank you, Director Duncan. Director Holmstrom. Thank you. I don't have much to add, uh, add this month. Uh, the Community Advisory Committee did not meet in September. They'll be meeting in October. So I look forward to that meeting, uh, meeting with those folks again. Uh, I did attend a meeting of the uh, South Central Area Neighborhood uh, SCAN, which is my local neighborhood. And so uh, but not much to report from that. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Holmstrom. Um, for before I dive into my uh, 
personal report, I, I do, again, want to talk about Cordon Road and where I, I think we need to be very mindful that I think this is the beginnings of what will be a belt line for Salem-Kaiser. They, they want a I-205 for the Salem-Kaiser area, and this is definitely the path that it's heading on. Um, I personally hate that. I live very close to Cordon Road. Um, when I go on my walks with my family, I can hear a Cordon Road. Um, and actually, the ro it's not the road that makes noise. It's, it's the cars, just to clarify. <laughs> um, and the speed of the cars. Um, and from where I live and where Cordon Road is situated, it's about a mile from I-5. And so the need for a redundant highway, I-5. I-5. I mean, I-5 is great for what it does. Um, it is grade separated. It, a lot of the safety concerns that we've articulated this evening are not relevant to I-5 because direction is headed in the same way. There, there are robust medians. There's a whole host of things. So um, I, I definitely think that this needs to be something that we as a board and as an entity keep our eyes on because um, at a minimum, we do not want our local government partners committing tens of millions of dollars to the construction of this and let alone the ongoing maintenance that will continue in perpetuity in addition to all of the negative behavioral things that will result and let alone the actual human carnage that will result from something like this. Um, so um, going, focusing on, on my personal report, next, uh, next week from October 2nd to the 8th is the week without driving. Um, last year I participated in that. Um, it is a, an initiative put on by Disability Mobility Initiative. Um, it's an organization based out of Washington State. Uh, they have partnered with America Walks this year and have gone national with that. Um, so I would encourage anyone uh, interested to participate in that. You can find uh, all kinds of information by going to americawalks.com or it might be .org. Um, and also uh, looking for the hashtag week without driving. Um, me, I've been looking ahead to my week seeing, you know, are there spots where I, I can do it without driving? And uh, there, there are several instances where I just cannot avoid driving. Uh, soccer practice in South Salem uh, with the absence of a route, future Route 22 and with no safe way to actually get there by bike. Um, my daughter and I, we are precluded from any alternative other than driving. Uh, and so I will be documenting that. Uh, I will not succeed in going a week without driving. However, I think that's part of the point of an effort like this, um, to document the frustration that, uh, by some estimates, a third of Americans deal with as their day-to-day. -day. Um, and so, uh, Looking forward to that. Would encourage anyone interested in participating in that as well. Um, this morning, as Director Carney mentioned, uh, myself, Director Carney, and General Manager Pollock, we attended the Council of Government's legislative breakfast. Um, started bright and early at 7 a.m. at the Chemeketa Center for Business and Industries. Uh, it was very well attended. 85 people came. We probably had, I don't know, eight legislators, representatives from a, several congressional offices. Um, it was great. I, I had an opportunity to speak about the region's priorities as adopted by the Council of Governments um, in my capacity as Vice Chair of the Council of Governments. Uh, I'll just briefly highlight those quickly. Um, so as an entity, we've uh, adopted three key regional priorities. First is housing and all associated um, things, so kind of in a frame of housing abundance and how do we get there. Uh, there's considerations like sewer, water transportation infrastructure. There's a whole host of things beyond just housing. Uh, the second is transportation and regional transportation considerations. Uh, explicitly in that priority is a consideration for regional transit. Um, an example of that is that later on in the month, on in fact, on October 25th at 3 p.m. at the Woodburn Chamber of Commerce, the Council of Governments will be hosting the first task force looking at Willamette Valley Regional Rail. Um, and so that is a um, and so just again, that's October 25th at 3 p.m. in Woodburn. More details will be forthcoming uh, with formal invites, but um, that is an example of the Council of Governments using its convening authority to pull together local jurisdictions from up and down the valley to talk about important issues. Um, as 
we as a state engage in some pretty significant conversations about what the future of transportation in the state looks like. I think uh, high capacity, frequent and reliable rail is absolutely a needed consideration, especially as the Portland metro region considers what tolling is. Um, I recently uh, watched some of the, what was it called, the Interim Committee on Transportation Planning uh, during subcommittee, thank you, of the, uh, during the legislative days that were happening this week. And there was a lot of discussion about equitable tolling. There wasn't a whole lot of discussion about equitable movement, which I think is far more important. Uh, the measure that we need to care about is movement, not uh, number of individuals in cars and the price at which they are paying for cars. Um, the only way to do that is buses and trains. And so um, I think we have an opportunity to inject that perspective into conversations. Um, these next two years will be very important. Um, this subcommittee and the, I believe the Joint Committee on Transportation uh, will be going on the road to hear from individuals across the state. And so it, uh, there will be opportunities for us to share our perspective, um, both as individuals, as parents, as you know, people in this community, but of course as board members as well. Um, I got distracted. The, the third regional priority is property tax reform, uh, which I think is most acutely felt by uh, our local government partners, however, uh, is of course impacts us. Uh, as one of our key sources of revenue is property tax. So the COG right now is keenly interested in considering reset at sale. Uh, our neighbors to the south in California have adopted something like that. And um, so measures five and 50 have seriously constrained local government budgets and we're dealing with the hangover of that from 15, 20 years ago. Um, and then Couple things I wanted to highlight um, earlier in the month, me wearing a slightly different hat, uh, was able to attend the Salem Bike Vision Family Festival. Um, it's an organization that I, I've uh, started with a couple other individuals in the community and it was a wonderful attendance. About 50 people from the community came out and uh, they were able to learn about a vision of a world where you can get around Salem with whichever mode you would like to. Um, there was a pop-up protected bike lane, which for many of the participants was the first time that they had ever seen, let alone ridden through what a protected bike lane might look like and feel like, which was great. Um, and so anyways, uh, wonderful event to be able to attend. And then um, I just wanted to say that in, my, in our work that will be embarking shortly on the service enhancement committee. Um, a lot of that will start after our retreat. The retreat will have a lot of important discussions around what it is that we as a board in totality would like to see at maybe a 30,000 foot level. And then we as the service enhancement committee uh, will kind of start some of the nuts and bolts work of that, of course, with significant staff assistance. Um, so just wanted to give that preview. Um, and with that, that concludes my report for the evening, and that concludes our agenda for the evening. Uh, so we are adjourned.